If you have your Bibles, and I hope you have, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 15. Matthew chapter 24, those of you that read the Bible know exactly when I get to 24th chapter of Matthew where we're headed. Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Father, bless this book now. In your holy name, amen. The Lord Jesus Christ called Daniel a prophet. You can do a little research, won't take much. You'll find out liberalism teaches that Daniel prophesied about 150 years before Christ. What they do is make it after the fact. But we believe the Bible. We believe that he's placed about 500 years or so before Christ. And that when he prophesies, he prophesies first of all of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, then the Medes and the Persians, then the Grecians, then the Romans. 1054 A.D., Rome was split. You have an eastern branch and a western branch. Orthodox in the east, Catholic in the west. That's the way it's been now for quite some time. This is a prophecy. This is a prophet. This is a real prophet. He's telling you something that is going to happen. The Lord Jesus Christ calls attention to something about his prophecy, though he said he talks about the abomination of desolation. And when he says he stands in the holy place, there's only one way that he could stand in the holy place. He'd have to stand in the temple. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but put that in the back of your mind. There's a temple. Now in 70 AD, you all know, Titus tore down the temple that's over there, the second temple. He tore it down, and they say, tradition has it, rumor has it, that he thought that uh, treasures were buried within the walls and so forth, which gave him an impetus to go in and tear it completely down. The only thing left of the original temple of Solomon, which is the second temple, and then Herod the Great expanded it, is the western wall. And the western wall is what's called the Wailing Wall. And it's a retaining wall to hold up what, uh, what they had 2,000 years ago. But it's important to understand that the Antichrist is mentioned directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes no mistake about it. In the book of Daniel, chapter number 9 and verse number 24, he talks about the 70 weeks of Daniel. This has to do, this is a separate message entirely, it's a wonderful study, but it simply has to do with dating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He dated when he would come. And of course he did just exactly like the word of God says he was. If the scripture speaks it, it will happen. So we're talking about the religion of the Antichrist this morning. What is it? It's a universal religion. This is what's very important. The thing that separates the Christian from everything else on this earth is your uniqueness. You say that there's only one way. You say there's only one God. You say, you say there's only one way to that God. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in the book of John, I am the way. I am as I am. That is ego I me in Greek. It is an emphatic statement. In plain words, he says, I am. And the word uh, I me literally means I exist. And I like that because he's, he's not saying I existed. And he's not saying, I will exist. He's saying, I exist. The ever-present eternal one, from everlasting to everlasting, I am that I am. But he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh the Father but by me. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Hear you, O Israel. The Lord your God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Jewish Shema. And the Bible says plainly, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So we declare today to you that the Lord Jesus Christ is Almighty God and everything else doesn't matter. Amen. Amen. So this is what we're dealing with today. The religion of the Antichrist. His religion is a religion of prosperity. It's a religion feel good. It's an entertainment type religion. They talk about the message of Christ. I'm not interested in talking about the message of Christ. I want to talk about the person of Christ. You're not saved by messages. You're saved by person. I am the way, he said. It's important to understand. Somebody said, well, that's just a kind of splitting hairs. That's a little nuance of expression so forth. No, it's not. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not. You can make the message of Christ say anything you want. Now, when you get like this, what separates the church today from the rest of the world? 
Where is the, where, where, where is it different? Uh, there is not. There is no difference. So here's what he's looking for. He's looking for a religion, the Antichrist is, where we all have so much in common. This is the way you compromise. We find a point of commonality. We pull things together that we can agree on. And this is what happened. You can retain some of your belief. You can believe some of your stuff. You can believe some of this. But we have a point where we all come together. And that's exactly the religion of the Antichrist. And this is the problem with our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot come together. Can two walk together except they be agreed? We cannot do it. The religion of the Antichrist has been practiced for millennium. There's nothing new about it. And a lot of you folks that are alive right now, and I'm talking about 20, 30, 40 somethings. You watch, you've been growing, you have grown up in a generation, in a culture that has embraced things that embarrassed my generation to death. Amen. 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 It's hard to understand that. But the generation that I grew up in would literally be embarrassed to death with the kind of stuff that people embrace openly, openly. Amen. Transgenderism, for example. Uh, gender dysphoria. What am I? Am I male, female, whatever? And you know, sodomy. Did you know that when you go back and study the Old Testament, you had temple prostitutes? Did you know that if you go back in history and study, you'll find that uh, there was a god named Anana. And this was a Sumerian goddess. And she was worshipped by Gala priests. And these priests were transgender. So there's nothing new about this. But it leads to something. It's pointing to something. There's a purpose. There's an end game in anything that you get in. Where is it going? What's the purpose in all of this? The Bible says in the book of Daniel chapter number 2 that they'll mix their seed with the seed of men. And it's talking about this legs, this feet, this uh, 1054 split, this Rome, the latter part of Rome, the, the end of the Gentile, times of the Gentiles. In 606 B.C., Daniel saw the times of the Gentiles began. And the times of the Gentiles will continue until a stone is cut out of the mountain and it smites that image on its feet and its destruction will be complete and immediate. It won't be slow. It will not be a degradation of Gentile powers. No, they're growing every day. Here we are facing nuclear war. No, it's not that. It is an immediate, absolute destruction of Gentile domain and powers on this earth. And this is exactly what we see in the book of Daniel. Daniel is a powerful, powerful book that gets us ready for what's coming. So what is going on here with the religion of the Antichrist? Not only does he have his doctrine, but he has his practice. He has transgenderism. He has temple prostitution. He wants worship. He said to the Lord Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter, Luke chapter 4, fall down and worship me. He is vain, vain, vain. He would even say to the Son of God, fall down and worship me. He seeks worship. And my, my friend today, there are many worshiping him. He said to the woman at the well, you worship, you know not what. John chapter number four. Salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. It never has ceased to be of the Jews. To the Jew first and all, so to the Greek. Jews wrote your Bible. And they're the ones who pointed the way to you. No Gentile wrote this Bible. The Jews wrote the Bible. The Word of God. So we live in a time of DNA. A time of DNA when we can literally change the structure of the DNA that has to do with the building of the body. We live in a time, and I re just read this yesterday, I did a little research into this, I wanted to find out what really happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Little boy and fat man. You know those two bombs that were dropped? Did you know, my dear friend, that the actual fissionable material, now understand what I'm saying, the part that exploded as an atomic bomb. You had all these explosions to cause it to explode. It wasn't much bigger than my hand. Right. Amen. Amen. Digest that for a moment. Yeah. That, that fission wasn't much bigger than my hand. Right. And it literally wiped. If you look at some of the photographs taken, you'll see shadows burned into concrete. It is the shadow of the individual that was alive when that explosion took place. They were immediately vaporized, but it burned a shadow in the wall where they were. Now we've got a madman in, in Russia who's threatening nuclear war. Yeah. Things aren't getting better, dear friend. If your hope is in the world, you've got it in the wrong place. 
But I'm going to try to tie this in with what's coming. So he's a, his religion is a religion of transgenderism, uh, gender dysphoria, religion of temple prostitution, the sodomites. And boy, have they ever been walking through the streets. Yes, amen. He wants worship. Strange things are beginning to develop. We'll go over there in the book of Revelation chapter number 9. Revelation 9. I want you to read something with me this morning now. The ninth chapter of Revelation. This is important. Revelation chapter number 9. You need to see this. Revelation 9 verse 1. The fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. And Tim was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened it the bottomless pit. And there rose a smoke out of the pit. Smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke. And there came out the whole, uh, uh, there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth. All right, now go on down with me to verse number seven. And the shape of the locust, and the shapes of the locust were like unto horses, prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. Their faces were the faces of what? That's a chimera. We have a mixture of an animal and we have the mixture of an animal and a human. This is coming up out of the pit in the Revelation. The bottomless pit. The angel of the bottomless pit is Abaddon Apollyon. Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek. Connected with Apollo or Apollos. He was a God, ancient God that was worshipped 2,000 years ago. Say, why is that important? It's important because CERN. How many of you have ever heard of that now? It connects Switzerland with France. Sits about midways in Europe. About 16.6 miles in circumference. uh, 150 feet beneath the surface of the land, depending on the topography of the land. Or up to five or 600 feet below the surface of the land. It is the largest man-made structure of its kind in the world. In the last three years, it's been shut down. Now it's starting up again. Years ago, one of the leaders or one of the who overseers of it said, "We're going to bust. We're going to go in here. And we're going to find out by this big bang. We're going to we're going to we're going to force these things together." And he says, "We do not know what will come out of this. We do not know if we're going to open the gates of hell." The Wall Street yeah. Journal, the Wall Street Journal, 2016. Head said this, CERN is seeking secrets of the universe, or maybe opening the portals of hell. Now, here's the thing about it. All of this ostensibly is so that they can determine where we came from, the Big Bang. We didn't come from a Big Bang. We came from a big God. (laughs) Big difference between the two. Amen. But this thing is connected with religion. The religion, there's a thing called the Hindu Trinity. The Hindu trinity is Shiva, Brahma, and Vishnu. Shiva is in what's called the Nataraj. He's dancing inside a circle. And it was given by, by the, by, by, by the nation, the Hindu, uh, it was given to them, it was given to them as a gift. And so they erected it, put it up in front, and now they have no doubt, my dear friend, looked very carefully at this thing. And I can't tell you what men worship and I can't tell you what they're doing in their private life. But I do know this, there are videos circulated years ago where they had a dance going on and this dance was connected with Shiva and all of this. And I'll say this, I'll say that Shiva is the God of destruction, but also restoration. That means he destroys and then he brings back into existence. This therefore connects them with them because they're going to destroy. They're going to bang these two together and then something's going to come out of it. And this something that comes out of it is the thing that people are, people are, they are literally mesmerized by it. They're searching for the Big Bang. They're searching for dark matter and black holes. And they said, we do not know what will come out of this. Well, let me tell you something, dear friend. If they do not know what came out of this or what will come out of this, they don't know if anything did come out of it. Amen. That's logic. If they don't know what's going to come out of it, how would they know if it did come out of it? Right? Okay. <laughs> it's built, they say, over the top of a palace, ancient temple. They say that it's put there over the top of this ancient temple of a palace. This is something, my dear friend, that you need to take a look at. Just keep it in mind that we've come to the place to where we can read the code of a human body 
We can, we can, we can destroy each other with something no bigger than the palm of my fist. And now we are, we are, we are colliding particles together so that we can get to the beginning of it all. And here we are. And my friend today, PhDs over here on this hill don't even know where they came from or where they're going. That's the truth. So where are we headed? How many of you have heard the Abraham Accords? The Abraham Accords are important because this is something that, uh, that came into existence to create peace. They want peace. And it seems to be, it seems to be growing because more countries are joining in with it. And therefore they want peace in the Holy Land. Well, the Bible says plainly that uh, when they say peace and safety, men want peace. How can we live on this planet and have peace? Well, anybody that's got half sense would want to have peace, would you not? Yeah. If you don't like the idea of peace, just look over at Ukraine right now and see what they're doing. But there's more involved than just peace. Right. There's more here than just that. Because this may very well fit into a covenant that is made with the Antichrist to get ready For the building of a temple. And this temple is what's important. I want to tell you something that's important now. This is so very important. Israel wants its temple back. May the 14th, 1947, just a few days from now, they will celebrate their 75th birthday. They're making a big deal about birthday 75. It's awakened something in them. And now they're looking, they're, they're focusing their attention upon the temple mount. They want their temple back. They want their priesthood. They want their sacrifice. They want it back. And of course it's been gone since how long? 70 AD. It's been gone a long time. In the diaspora, my people are scattered to the ends of the earth. But God said through Isaiah chapter number 11, He said, I will reach forth my hand the second time. He's already done it one time, the second time. To make Aliyah, he'll bring his Jews from the four corners of the earth. And he's going to bring them back into Jerusalem. He's going to make them, he's going to make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. It's going to be something that bothers people. Right now, the most important place on this earth is Jerusalem. Keep your eye on a temple. If you see a temple being built, get ready. Get ready. Because the Antichrist will enter into that temple and declare himself to be God. Now don't you turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation 11. And I'm going to try to get into a little specifics with you about what happens in the tribulation. Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation 11 it says, verse 1. There was given to me a reed like to a rod. The angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. Now watch this. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Here we are. Jerusalem is being trodden down of the Gentiles. Right. It's been trodden down. In my lifetime, in everybody in this house, your lifetime, it has been trodden down of the Gentiles. Just in the last few days, folks, have you seen the, the dog fight that's going on in the Temple Mount? Ramadan, every time, every year we have Ramadan, we have that. Verse number three. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days closed in sackcloth. Closed in sackcloth. What is that? Three and one half years. Right. And right here we learn in scripture that three and a half years is three and a half years of a thirty day month. In verse number four, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, this is important now. Fire will proceed out of their mouth and and, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now watch this. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as oft as they will. They have enormous power. These two witnesses, I believe they're Moses and Elijah. Some folks don't, but I believe they're Moses and Elijah. I've got a reason for that. But this is what's important about this. 
They prophesy for three and a half years. Their prophecy is from the first of the tribulation, from the beginning of it, for three and a half years. If they finish their prophecy at the end of three and a half years, what, where do they, what places them, where, do, where are they placed in a seven year period of time? <laughs> in the middle. Right smack in the middle of it. All right. For the first three and one half years, the Antichrist cannot stop them. He may try, but he cannot overcome them. Nothing can overcome them for the first three and one half years. Why? Because they have the anointing of God. It says, these are the two olive trees, verse 4, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Go back to the book of Zechariah and you'll find it says the same thing. The two olive trees. So what does it lead up to? Note carefully now. Verse 7. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So at the end of three and a half years, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, will die at the hands of the Antichrist. Moses called Israel back to God. Elijah called Israel back. Back to God. Moses called them back at Sinai. And Elijah called them back at what? Carmel. Carmel. They built the altar. The water came. And the fire lapped it up. Elijah is connected with fire more than once. But listen, this is what's important. Moses and Elijah, at the beginning of the tribulation period... Began to preach to Israel. They began to bring the message of the word of God. That God is coming back. He's coming again. We read about that in the gospels. Where on the top of the mountain of transfiguration. Moses and Elijah appeared to to the disciples. That's the 17th chapter of Matthew. Read it carefully. And you'll find out that that appearance of Moses and Elijah on top of that mountain was preparatory to the coming of the Lord. 2,000 years ago when Christ was here, He had to die on the cross. He had to. But up until Acts chapter number 7, He could have come again. That's the key to understanding that. He could have come again. The last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the Bible mentions Moses And Elijah. Before that great and terrible day of the Lord. And they show up in the gospel of Matthew. And here they show up in Revelation chapter 11. And they show up here before that great and terrible day of the Lord. You see it's in the midst of that tribulation. My dear friend when everything goes south. Because when they die. Go back to go to Revelation 13 with me. Revelation chapter number 13. Verse 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, seat, and authority. Chapter number 12 tells you who the dragon is. It's the devil. But verse number three, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now look at this. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Look at that. After three and a half years, they're untouchable. And at the end of three and a half years, they die. Their witness ceases. When their witness ceases, then God removes something from this earth. But for three and one half years, the Antichrist is unable to overcome them. He can't stop them. But look in your Bible in Revelation chapter number 13. Look at this. He has a deadly wound healed, and then, and then, nobody can stop him. For it says, who is likened to the beast, who is able to make war with him? There we are. Since Moses and Elijah were defeated, 
since they were pushed asunder, who can make war against this beast? That is then, it is then that he demands worship. Once we know who he is, we'll know his name, his number, and his mark. We tell that plainly in Revelation 13. Of course, we, I'm talking about you folks, not me. I plan to be gone from here. <laughs> now, how, many, how many of you plan to be gone from here? When I... But now, how many of you this morning can see how close we are here? I mean, look at this. There's some things happening today that you just can't, you can't just push them aside. So he overcomes Moses and Elijah. And when he overcomes Moses and Elijah, the whole world says, my goodness, who's Moses and who's Elijah? How do they know who he is? How did they know who he was, who they were on top of the mountain of transfiguration? Nobody had a photograph of Moses and Elijah. This is a spiritual revelation. This is God revealing them to. All right? Now imagine the Jews when tribulation appeared. Imagine the Jews, friend. Moses and Elijah shows up to them. Good night. I mean, what can you say? Moses, there's nobody higher in Judaism than Moses. Moses. And Elijah, the great, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. And so they show up and they begin to witness and they call fire down from heaven, turn the oceans to blood. And nobody can touch them. They have all kinds of authority and power. And then at the end of this, when the Antichrist cannot stop them and finally he does, the beast, that's when they begin to cry out, who can make war against the beast? Who can make war against him? And of course nobody can except this one. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. In verse 11, Revelation 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, glory to God, and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. He's the way, the truth, and in righteousness he doth judge and make what? War. He's coming as a man of war. His eyes a flame of fire, and his head many crowns, and a name written no man knew but he himself. Clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, his name is called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth forth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He tread the wine... Treadeth the winepress, the fierceness and wrath of God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God, that he may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast the Antichrist and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Earlier in the Bible, book of Revelation, it says they are gathered together to the great battle of Armageddon. Ar in Hebrew is mountain, mountain of Megiddo. That's what Armageddon means. And so he says here, and the beast was taken... With him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Lord have mercy. And the remnant were slain with a sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with the flesh. It's going to happen, folks. Here's what's happening, and I'll shut up. If you receive transgenderism and embrace sodomy, that's part of this culture today, you have embraced their spirit. The spirit, that's what you've embraced. You haven't embraced anything intellectual, forget it. You've embraced their spirit. Once you embrace their spirit, that's your life. You want to be part of it. You want them to be part of you. That's what you live for. That's what you live about. That's how you identify. That's, that's the glasses you look through as you look at anything. You filter it through that. And this is exactly where America is headed now. Amen. It's one thing, and I'll be quiet. <clears throat> how many ever heard of Elon Musk? 
He's supposed to be the richest man in the world. Got over two hundred billion. That's with a B. Dollars. Two hundred over two hundred billion. And did you know that he's uh, he's taking over Twitter? And he's not taking it over to get on there and preach the gospel. No, no. But he is apparently a libertine and believes in freedom of speech. And what he's simply saying is, I'm going to give a platform for everybody to begin to, to be able to speak their part. I, that, I love that. Yeah. I've told you a thousand times. That's what freedom of speech is about. I may not agree with what you say, but you've got a right to say it. And that's what he's going to do. And that, you say, well, how would God use somebody like him? He used Pharaoh. Why, well, good night. God can use anybody or anything he wants to. Isn't that amazing, though, how this is coming in? Are you ready? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Wouldn't it be wonderful if he came this morning? Wouldn't it be wonderful? Father, in thy name I pray. Bless your holy word. Maybe somebody in the house today scared to death. This has really gotten a hold of their heart. They can really see. They've lived long enough in this world to see what I'm talking about. They know which direction it's headed. Help them do something about it. All they have to do is what that thief on that cross did. If he can be saved that way, we can be saved that way. Lord, remember me. Anybody can say that, can't they? Lord, remember me. He didn't confess all of his sins of his life. If he lived, the confession would have come, sure. All the repentance that would come with it, sure. But he didn't have any time for that. He just simply said, Lord, remember me. Is there anybody in this house this morning would raise your hand and say, Preacher, tell the Lord to remember me. Anybody? God bless you there and back here. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand and say, Preacher, tell the Lord to remember me. Father, you saw these hands that went up, and I'm going to do what I said I'd do. Remember them, Lord. Move in their heart. Show them the greatest friend they ever had is the Lord Jesus. Nobody ever loved them like the Lord Jesus. And he's able to save. He's able to save to the uttermost all that come to him. I pray for them. Let them do something about it. Let them come today. Our Father, we pray against the enemy, the wicked one. And Father, we pray for the movement of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up, brother.